Thank you so much. I am honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me, um, taking the risk of inviting an artist to speak at a commencement service. It is a delight to be here and to congratulate you on your accomplishments today. This day we celebrate, um, as well as to mark a beginning of your journey of your career, of your path to reveal your particular calling. So this is a genesis moment. No matter what your journey has been, this marks a moment of a new beginning. So we celebrate both what you have done, accomplished, and the pregnant possibility of this day. So to mark this Genesis moment, I want to speak to you about a painting. Painting that I consider to be a Genesis painting. The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Some of you have cards, I think, um, that, that this painting was printed by. It's a famous painting. You can probably call it up on, it, on, on your um, iPhones. <laughs> Um, if you look up the starry night, but you probably have seen it. This painting has been discussed, sang about, and given much attention over the years since it was painted in 1889. The painting is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, so I do hope that all of you will get to see it firsthand. A poor reproduction would not do justice to this magnificent work. Even a good reproduction will not do justice to the physicality of the surface painted with the best pigments available in Vincent time, hand mixed and hand poured in newly invented form of technology called tube paint. Though this image is well known, we may miss seeing a deeper significance of this painting, to see it as a Genesis painting. But first, let me speak about the artist, Vincent. He was born, most people don't know, that he was born in a lineage of Dutch Reformed pastors. And he himself trained for and desired to become a pastor. It was only when the church rejected his plea that he instead opted to work as an evangelist to the poor. Among the poor, he lived with them in a kind of a Franciscan manner, with devotion, living in squalid conditions. The church authorities who sent him there was appalled by the conditions Vincent chose to live in and rejected him, him again, and pronounced him, quote, unfit for the dignity of the priesthood, end quote. Vincent spoke five languages and wrote fluently in three. Today, his many letters are considered by Dutch literature experts to be one of their masterpieces of epistles. He might have been graduating from this university today with a graduate degree, if it was not for, of course, the mental illness that he was plagued with all of his life. Though he was rejected by the church authorities twice, it was while he toiled to work with the poor in the coal mines of Belgium that he began to draw the miners. He was not formally trained in painting and drawing at that point, and yet, as he drew, he discovered that he could communicate visually more deeply about the compassion he felt for humanity and God's presence in the lives of the poor than when he was attempting to do so in the pulpit. Art became then a way to capture their Genesis moments. 
hidden behind every darkened face, even in the candlelight. Art gave Vincent a way to tap into the potential of each moment, to see afresh life's struggles in light of Christ's presence. And to Vincent, Christ was the ultimate artist. He wrote to a younger artist, Emile Bernard, later in a letter, advising him, you do very well to read the Bible. I start there because I've always refrained from recommending it to you. Lived as serenely as an artist, greater than all artists, disdaining marble and clay and paint, working in living flesh. That is, this extraordinary artist, hardly conceivable, with obstruse instrument of your all nervous and stupefied modern brains, made neither statue nor lip paintings or even books, but he made it clear. He made living men, immortals. This great artist, Christ, although he disdained writing books on ideas and feelings, was certainly much less disdainful of the spoken word, the parable, above all. What a sower, what a harvest, what a fig tree. And I might add, what a starry night. His paintings are color-filled parables of Genesis moments, generatively given to us in flesh with canvas and paint. By the time his untimely and tragic death came, he had only three years to have devoted his life to paintings that he is now well known for. The works in that time, in those three years, are in collections of museums all over the world. So let us today, just for a moment, consider the starry night, this painting famed landscape he painted in all. Notice that at the very center of the painting is a white Dutch reformed church, which did not exist in all France. <laughs> Vincent imported this church building of his childhood, pasting it into the landscape of all because he wanted to create a parable of his own life. If you are to take out the church, you can place a pinky over the church, from the painting, the whole painting falls apart visually. It is the only vertical form, aside from the dominant cypress tree on the left, which juts out to break the horizon planes. The cypress tree, and the church are two forms that connect heaven and earth. Without the church, the cypress tree takes over the swirl of the movement, and there is no visual center to hold the painting in tension between heaven and earth. The church is critical for the painting. But notice, too, that the homes surrounding the church are lit with warm light. But the church is the only building in a painting that is completely dark. Here's Vincent's message. The spirit has left the church, at least the building but it's alive in nature. If you follow the visual flow of the painting, your eye will cycle upward, but still anchored by the church building. Our gaze will end up on the right upper hand corner at the sun, moon. Notice it is not just the moon or sun, but a combination. Vincent wanted to show that the Spirit of God transcends even nature herself. 
that in resurrection, in the new earth and new heaven, a complete new order will shape things to come. Vincent wrote to Bernard, this young artist, supposing that there are also lines and forms as well as colors on the other innumerable planets and suns, it will remain praiseworthy of us to maintain a certain serenity with regard to the possibilities of a painting of painting under superior and changed conditions of existence. An existence changed by a phenomenon no queerer and no more surprising than the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly or of the white grub into a cockchafer. You and I are caterpillars about to be transformed into butterflies. We are in the threshold of seeing what N.T. Wright called the post-resurrection reality of life after life after death. Vincent painted this superior and changed condition of existence already here, but not quite yet. He developed a visual diction that serves as a bridge between our current condition and a future transformed. Genesis condition. In other words, he envisioned the transformation before it happened and by faith painted the world to come. By doing so, Vincent depicted a world that he was intuiting, a world in which the church still structurally holds things together, but one in which the light has gone out of our church building. Art poses questions. Art probes into our lives as living parables. So the question I ask of you today is this. What do we do if Vincent is right? What do we do in a culture in which the light of the spirit has gone out of the church buildings? and instead went swirling into nature and into the margins of life? What do you do in a culture in which the church stands as a structural homage to the moral underpinning which keeps the world from falling apart? Many have noted that your generation, perhaps not yourself, but your generation is not eager to join a church. The fastest growing denomination, I am told, is of none. Not N-U-N, but N-O-N-E. Your generation do not show interest in denominationalism. And yet, it does not seem that your generation is done with Jesus or spirituality. You have far more invested interest in seeking justice and caring for our environment than my generation. So I pose, pose to you today that you are actually living in the world that Vincent depicted. The church has kept the structure of the truth in society, but we have lost the spirit in creating beauty. The church is no longer where the masses come to know the creator of beauty. Tim Keller, my pastor, says that we have invited Jesus as our savior, but we also need to invite him as our creator. Every challenge is also an opportunity to exercise generative thinking, to think through the problems, the fears, and seek out the light that shines, however hidden. The psalmist tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God. If the church is darkened, perhaps we should focus on where the spirit is truly moving and pay attention to where the colors are the most intense. 
The gospel reality not just speaks of what we do inside a church building, but to the presence of the divine already evident in nature and in creativity. Instead of speaking of God just in private spheres and speaking of him only inside the church buildings, we must proclaim him to the very fabric of our calling as teachers, as nurses, as engineers, as artists, and as writers. We must see our occupations as part of the glorious reality in which God has already manifested the Spirit's incorruptible visage. In a world in which the churches may be darkened, we cannot have Sunday faith and live as if Christ is not present to the, on the rest of our days. We need to acknowledge that the presence of grace in the darkest of areas, even in areas that we would rather hide from God. The church is not a building, but a collective souls of people of God. Whether we are politicians, dancers, entrepreneurs, or plumbers, we are called into the starry night of our complex existence as we too swirl into the darker mystery of our 21st century vista. Because the heavens declare the glory of God, we must carry the torch of truth, justice, and the aroma of beauty outside of the walls of our institutions. Christianity in the 20th century has been turned into an adjective existence. We have Christian music, Christian art, Christian plumbers, and I am speaking at a Christian college. Now, I'm not saying that we should not use these terms, but we need to realize that these categories in themselves are the device of pluralism. And they can ultimately undermine our desire to infuse all of life with Christ's presence. That's why I'm not a Christian artist. I am a Christian. Yes, and I am an artist. I want Christ to be my whole being. Vincent was not a Christian artist either. But in Christ, he painted the heavens, declaring the glory of God. Let Christ be a noun in your lives. Let your whole being ooze out like the painted colors with the splendor and the mystery of Christ. The Spirit welcomes you into the margins, into the liminal spaces far away from the doors of the church. And yet, there, you will be met by a shepherd, artist, who will guide you into the wider pasture of culture. He will guide you into the night skies in which the sun and the moon are held together by his hand. Create in love as Vincent so loved the world that rejected him. He loved the church as well. He so longed to be home there in the church, in the only building without light. In such darkness, we may be overwhelmed, but precisely because it is dark, and precisely because we must look up, we experience a Genesis moment. This Genesis reality it's Vincent's gift to us today, to you graduates. Given to your journey forward, especially in the dark, churches can be lit up. Many of you will be called to do such a work within churches. Such work is important as it connects us to the central skeleton of truth, barely holding the world together today. May your efforts, however small, light a candle inside that darkened church. May your sacrifice be an offering to fill the vacant room 
with the aroma of Christ. May a banquet table be prepared with a feast fit for a king to welcome the marginalized, oppressed, and the poor, including artists like Vincent. Even though your labor may be in a thick, dark night, may you be like stars in the deep skies of that starry night, giving Genesis moments to those who seek and admire them. God bless you, and congratulations. Marco, thank you for those words you have prayerfully and thoughtfully shared with us, our graduating class of 2012. May your uh, bright and insightful message illuminate their lives for years to come so that they may become, as the Apostle Paul writes, blameless and pure, in which they shine like stars in the universe. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.